How do you like that? Come all the way up here, and I left it down there. How do you like that for crying out loud? You go down and get it real quick. Go down there and get it uh, very fast. It's down. It, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what. Now you just be calm. You just let me handle it here. It's down there on the inside the place where we were sitting, you know, in the little place there with the chairs and the tables. You'll find it down there, and it's a clipping. And the clipping is headed, uh, it's from Italy. Look, it's a big clipping from Italy. Go, quick, newspaper. Come on, come on, come on. Post tags. Go, 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 go. And uh, tell her it's about, uh, I'll tell you, hey, hey, hey uh, Walt. Would you tell her it's about... Well, she's gone already, huh? Well, all right, good luck. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you what... What? Uh, it's a funny thing. Uh, I think I think tonight what we'll do is, since, it, uh, since it's this way... Oh, it's, 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 we're, we're being faced with it on all sides. Uh, I think tonight we're... Uh, the tonight's program is about the hang-up. Now, uh, immediately, 14,000 guys get bristling out there because, you know, I, the thing I would like to say before we go any further is how is your hang-up doing? Now, everybody's got one. There's no question about it. We've all got something that is stuck in us crosswise. Uh, how is your hang-up doing? Is it, is it doing all right? Oh, I'm sure it is. Uh, this is the age of the great hang-up. And hang-ups take, oh, they, they take such a wondrous, wondrous variety of colors and shapes and forms. And, and some hang-ups, you know, some guys have taken a hang-up, Walt, and have made it into a career. Believe me. No, it's the truth. You know that recently a, a, a group of psychologists were doing a nationwide study. Now, these are psychologists, Walt. A nationwide study of top executives. And they found that almost to a man they were hung up. And that's how they got to be big top executives. They were bugged. These guys were, you know, they, they found them to be neurotic. They had, they had tremendous sadistic tendencies. They found that they were angry men, and they wound up becoming the top man in the organization. Then later, of course, they wrote these plaques, you know, that says, I believe in the dignity of man. I, I believe in the basic uh, uh, honor of the individual. Funny thing, I, I was, uh, I'm, I'm an old plaque reader. And, uh, and since we are dealing with the hang-up tonight, and we might as well we'll deal with all the way, there was a guy who sent me a, a cup, uh, a paper cup, and I have it. I'm putting this into my vast file of trivia. Uh, this will be the trivia that I'm keeping for a thousand years hence. Uh, when they dig up my file of trivia, it'll, I think it'll say more than, than the Museum of Modern Art when they dig it up, because it tells how it really was. I am presenting to you now. I'm holding up before all of you. Look me right into that old voice coil now. Look me right in the voice coil. I'm holding up before you Exhibit A2 tonight on the hang-up. Exhibit A2 represents a, a little paper cup that came out. Now, look. Look in here. Hey, look. Look this way. It's a paper cup that came out of what looked like an innocent Coke machine. Uh, and the guy put a dime in there, and he, was, he thought he was going to get a Coke, see? And out came this paper cup. <laughs> this, the Coke pours in it. He takes the cup out, and what do you think the cup says? The cup has a picture on it of a door, and the door has a big sign over it that's hammered on. It says, Restricted. And underneath it, it says, along with his Coke, it says, Security is our business. Never cut my microphone. Won't you not stop it? Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Hold it, 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 Right on, all these people. Yeah, that's very good. <laughs> you know better than to cut this wall for crying out loud. This is not John Gambling. Now stop it. John Gambling is not me. Uh, and I, I kind of like the big hang-up. Our hang-up is getting so big now that even with Cokes, we are sending it out now. And on the other side of his little, of his little uh, Coke box there, the little thing, the little, the little, uh, the little uh, cup, it says, A locked mouth, key to security. Well, that makes your Coke go down real good. A locked mouth, key to security, the pause that refreshes. All right, there it goes. It's going right in there. Now, now we're, we're going to talk in terms tonight. Of, now, hold it. Hey, you're queuing it up on the air wall. It's coming through real big. We're going <laughs> to talk here in terms now of the cosmic, the truly cosmic hang-up. Now, before we go any further, I think we shall have a little cosmic hang-up music. Walt, that's it. What's in the mind of the world?
پونده یاد و فقیم نم که شما نیاد و پریاچی پریاچی افکلان لفتی لچه بلا را یوم پریاچی پاچه دیم آل Yeah. <laughs> All right, now there you have the, 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 the beginnings of the cosmic hang-up. Now from Italy, I read, Cremona, Italy. Friends have tried to persuade Francesco Ghisoni, 53, that he should seek another girl, a friend. They have hinted in a gentle way that perhaps Angela Mondini, 44, just isn't attracted to him. But Kizoni has remained unconvinced. <laughs> just to be, yeah, because she's been telling him for 28 years that she can't stand the sight of him doesn't mean a thing as far as he's concerned. But Shalani Pagliacci love Miss Mondini has been taking Gizoni to court regularly since 1935 and accusing him of molesting her in an attempt to prove how she feels. She's a being coy, Gizoni says. He chalks up the court battles to the hazards of love. Amore, amore, she's a being coy. Last January, Gizoni decided that after 28 years, he couldn't be accused of being too forward if he kissed his loved one. He waited in the courtyard of her apartment, the building. When she appeared, he rushed up and embraced her and kissed her on both cheeks. Pagliacci, oh, Pagliacci. 28 years, oh, mamma mia. Back at the court he went. The judge has sentenced him to two years and three months in jail and payments of damages. Italy's most long-suffering suitor seemed finished, but Gizoni appealed, and in the meantime passed his idle hours of writing love letters to the woman who spurned him. Pagliacci! Pagliacci! Now, Miss Mondini has gone back to court and filed the new charges of molestation against her admirer. She has introduced 50 love letters as evidence. In the meantime, she's fighting him in a civil court to collect the damages awarded by the criminal court earlier. The civil court recently accepted the request of her lawyer for the seizure and trust of his farm and house at Castellaveto. Gizoni says... He will always love her. She's a being coy. Mamma mia. Now, that's uh, it's, uh, <laughs> our cosmic hang-up for tonight. Now, I can, I can imagine 45,000 chicks out there <laughs> turning 14 colors. If only that uh, would happen to me. Uh. <laughs> well, that guy's got a bigger hang-up than Albie. I'll tell you. And, uh... <laughs> You know, if you wrote a play like that, no one would believe it. They would say, why no guy would hang around for 30 years, running around out there and grabbing her. And, oh, no, my, no, my, she's a being coy. She'll come. <laughs> you know,
No, no, uh, it's this this uh, this hang up thing. You know, this is a very very interesting problem. Uh, well, speaking of hang ups, this is W O R A M at F M New York. I don't think W O R doesn't have a hang up. You just listen carefully. I'll tell. <laughs> It just takes a little listening, that's all. Just stick around long enough and everybody will betray himself in the end, believe me. But uh, I saw this piece, you know, and and it's a funny thing. A very peculiar image came back to me, a, a, a very strange memory. And I hope, I hope you, you have to fill in a lot of blanks. You know, memory is a spooky and sneaky thing. But when I'm this kid... I had a lot of very strange outrider sort of second half baked relatives who were beyond who weren't really relatives you know the kind of relatives that are always described as somebody's aunt and they happen to be this person who's somebody's aunt it is happens to be just like a best friend of the family who is a sort of adopted uncle kind of thing you know and the next thing you know you have what could be called almost uh, uh, artificial plastic handmade relatives you know the kind of people you go to weddings of people you don't know, that sort of thing. You know, it's, it's, it's a very bad scene. It can be very bad when when somebody calls up, you know, once and you don't remember them. But but we had a situation very similar to that. My my family, since my mother had four sisters, all of whom were married, and all of whom had nine kids, and uh, they came from a mother who had three sisters. All of whom were, you know, it got very complicated, and there were so many best friends that, as a little kid, I couldn't tell Aunt Rose from Aunt Min. Aunt Rose just seemed to be one of the aunt's best friends and becomes Aunt Somebody. So there were all kinds of strange people. Well, I remember one guy in particular, uh, as a kid, you know, it's, it's funny how you will, you will fill in all kinds of blanks. There was a guy they used to call in the family Uncle Amel. Uncle Amel. Uncle Amel, you have not heard me refer to Uncle Amel. Well, I'll tell you who Uncle Amel was, as far as I can divine now at this point. Uncle Amel was a discarded suitor of one of my grandmother's sisters. <laughs> so Uncle Amel, 150 years before I was born, had attached himself to the family. And Uncle Amel was always at every family operation of a cosmic variety. You know, if there's a wedding, uh, a funeral, uh, a wake, uh, a giant anniversary, Uncle Amel was there. And Uncle Amel had a white mustache of the walrus type. He was as bald as a billiard ball. He was sort of little, uh, sort of stooped over, and he was just, well, that is, <laughs> that is your grand aunt, great aunt Teresa's Uncle Amel. Well, it was just described as that. Now, now, my great aunt Teresa. Now, this is not Aunt Teresa, but my great aunt Teresa. My great aunt Teresa had a. She had a husband who was like 109. She had the grown-up people who were all grown up and living all over in Wisconsin and everyone, every place you know. She made potato salad. She was an older lady that had stays all over her, you know, that creaked. She had she had white hair. She, she, she knitted, and she would always send doilies to family events where there was a gift required. That was the great Aunt Teresa. But attached somehow to her was Uncle Amel. Well, you know, it was a funny bit. You know, the kids just accept, you know, there's our old Uncle Amel. Uh, Uncle Amel, I remember one great thing about Uncle Amel, because he, he, he represented something absolutely foreign to our whole family. Uncle Amel had been in the Spanish-American War. To give you an idea, he was about like 109, see? And, and old Uncle Amo would sit around, and he was the... He, there is something about guys with a supreme hang-up like that. They develop a lifelong habit of apologizing for being around. They really do. Uh, they, are, they, they were rejected at one point by Aunt Teresa. And so, of course, his whole life is, well, I'll just sit here in the corner. I'll, I'll sit in the corner, and I'll... Whenever you need me, we'll just give a call. I'll, I'll, I'll be here. I'll be here. I'll, whenever you need me, I'll be here. Hey, are you sure you don't want to use the Buick? Yeah, the Buick. Uh, I'll be here. This guy, for approximately 45 years, had just stood on the outskirts of Aunt Teresa's life and sent her Christmas cards 
would come over. He was the old, old friend of the family. But what he really was was the guy that lost out. You know, we when we watch movies, you know, we always see in the in the in the great moment, you know, when when the Rock Hudson comes galloping up and rescues Debbie from that clown that she's about to marry. We always just think it's good enough for that clown, you know. After crying out loud, well, Jeffrey Lynn, he's got a lot of nerve trying to think he's going to make that scene, you know. Uh, you know, whoever whoever it is, is, there's always about nine actors who play the guy who never makes the scene. They're the guy who we see. Bested. They represent a kind of evil, you know. They get bested by the really, true, beautiful man. Tony Perkins arrives and sweeps him out. And, and you know that, I mean, it was fated. It was fate. It's kismet, you know, that Audrey Hepburn was certainly not, was not right for Zachary Scott. She was just right, however, for Rock. And we knew that all the way from the scene. But, but you see, Zachary didn't, <laughs> if he's a real person. He didn't. He never accepted this, you know. He did not accept the fact that this guy came blum, 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 galloping up on that horse and swept up. Why do you think he's, you know, he's going to be a sore head? But believe me, there are, there are eight million guys out there who played Jeffrey Lynn to somebody else's. They're listening right now to somebody else's Clark Gable. You know, well, you don't give up that easy. You never see yourself as the third or the weak leg of a triangle. You know, the little one there that falls over immediately, Rock shows up. Well, I, I you know, I'm, I'm listening to this, you know, and I read this article and I think of Gizoni. Gizoni says she loved me at the, she is a being a coy. Well, immediately, Uncle Amel. I hadn't thought of Uncle Amel in nine million years. Suddenly, Uncle Amel hits me. Well, right after after I got back from the army, this is how the how I learned about this scene. After I got, I'm I'm now a grown up. You know, they can tell you things. You're a grown up. You know, they 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 can start unloading on you if you're lucky enough. What really went on behind the scenes, behind the beaded curtains? You know, <laughs> up to this point, you know, it's been pure conjecture. And the kids once in a while see something written on the sidewalk, you know, or they see something stuck in a book somewhere, or they hear a veiled reference. Well, we don't want to go over that again, do we, Fred? And the kids say, why don't you go over what? You know, what, 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 what? And, of course, he's cut out immediately. Past history is gone. But let me tell you, kids. Hey, kids, you listening, kids? Around you is a veritable hotbed of past history. You look at your mother, and you look at your old man, and it ain't what it seems to be. A lot of stuff went on you would never believe, kid. <laughs> I'm sorry, you know, they did not just invent entanglements when Tennessee Williams came on the scene. It went a little bit before that. Well, well, you know, I, it's right after the war. I get back, see, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I got a suit on. I'm a very official. And uh, I got a three-day pass for a family funeral. It was the first funeral I had ever attended in the family as a grown-up. I had been to a couple... But this was very official. And I'm still in uniform. I'm still in the Army. And I'm about to be discharged. You know, that kind of scene where you're waiting around. And, and so the, the, the telegram came. And they said, uh, so-and-so has gone. And would you, could you please come for the funeral? Well, it was official kind of thing. So, but but not, it did not involve me at all. It was one of those long, distant kind of things where you have to go and one thing or another. It was not a moving experience for me. But nevertheless, we arrive up at this up at this cemetery up on the north side of Chicago. And now, years have passed. I have not seen the family. You know, this 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 way far out the outrigger part of the family for many many moons. You know how families slowly drift apart, Ed, slowly form little orbits of their own. And one day, all of a sudden, they're all there again. But they look like they're five million years older, and it's, it's very strange. And yeah, they, they all have got little suits on, and and they, it's just like from another world, from another strange dream. That's really what it's like. It's from a dream somehow. Well, I'm there at this before we go out to this funeral. You know, we're at the funeral parlor, and and I just know the immediate people there, and I'm the. I'm the I'm the one that's in the army. You see, and there was another guy who was who was called back. He was in the Marines, and the two of us right away. Oh, you know, whew, you know, we could hardly wait to get back to the orderly room. You know, this is a, this is a real this is a real bad scene. So we're we're standing around, and we could smell the flowers and everything. And and my mother is kind of she, you could see it was one of those things where you have to be sad and 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 involved. And she hadn't seen the person who had died like in 25 years, and at that point had only seen him twice, you know, that kind of thing. So everybody's walking. It's like a distant cousin, a cousin or something. So we're all walking around and the whole thing, and the, the immediate family's down there, one thing or another. Well, along came this vision right up the aisle 
I, I'm going to try to describe it to you. Right up the aisle, through these these yellow doors with the yellow glass, you know, and the music is playing, and you could smell the lilies, and you could smell the rose of the valleys. You could smell all these things, and it's, you know, that funny smell in funeral parlors, and this kind of a odd straight seats. It's sort of a half church, half used car sales room. It's a very peculiar thing. It, it, it reminds you of, of something that a Rudolph Valentino movie could have been shot in, you know, little mosque-like things. So we're all, we're all sort of, you know, vaguely uncomfortable, and you don't know what to do. And people say things. They all look like they're made out of wax and sort of talk, and they, they get out in the ante room and they talk, and it's raining. It's always raining, and it's raining. It's a funeral. We're going to go out. Well, suddenly coming down the aisle, I see this, and there is this magnificent woman, absolutely a magnificent woman in black and she has white hair piled right up all the way up to the top she has this beautiful you know that kind of beautiful skin some very elderly ladies seem to get that that sort of uh, almost it's, it's so fragile that you, you figure if you touch it it just dissolves you know that beautiful lovely skin with these with these brilliant blue eyes the, 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 these true Anglo-Saxon blue eyes that were like painted on her. And she's, she's tall, she has a flat stomach, and she's, she's wearing this, this black dress, and she's, she's coming down, and she's got, she's got on her arm, she's got this very elderly old gentleman who's kind of shaking, and he's wearing a black suit, you know, and he's got, he's got a hat on, and he's, he's got white hair, and, and it's obviously her husband. And, and they're coming down the aisle there. They're going, and, and my mother says, oh, there's, there's your great Aunt Teresa. I says, great Aunt Teresa? Oh, you know, suddenly it goes back, my mind goes back nine million years to the other family functions. She is showing up. She's probably 85 now. And she is, is still tall and, and, and strong. And her husband, who is probably 87, is bent over a little bit, you know, and he's coming down there, and he's got this round face, like you see carved in these Toby mugs, you know, and he's <laughs> he's sort of just a little bit senile, he's sort of chuckling a little, <laughs> and and they come down and they they pay their little obeisances, but directly behind them, directly behind them is another little bent over figure wearing a black suit, he's got sparse white hair, no hat. He's got this, this kind of parchment skin, and he's vaguely bent, not quite as much bent over as the husband, but he's bent over. And he has a, a sense of kind of propriety about him, as though this is his, this, these are his people, this is his world, this is all of his. And yet, he was about five or six steps behind them, maybe seven or eight, you know, he's just sort of walking along, and he's saying hello. He should be Gates, V Gates, V Gates. He's coming down, V Gates. That was an old family greeting. V Gates, V Gates, to him. V Gates. So V Gates, V Gates. And, and, and my mother, my mother, and my father, both of them. Oh, there's there's Uncle Emil. Go say hello to Uncle Emil. He'd be so pleased. To me, you see, now I have a big clunk on a, you know, corporal sitting there all, you know, sitting there, you know, in my boots and everything. He says, go go say hello, Uncle Uncle Emil. I said, who's Uncle Emil? The devil's Uncle Lamo. Go, come on, go on. He'd be so pleased. Go say hello to him. You remember Uncle Lamo, don't you? Uncle Lamo. Uncle Lamo. Uncle, uncle, who, uncle, my uncle. He's not my uh, uncle. Lamo. I never heard of him. Do you remember Uncle Lamo? That's 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 Aunt Teresa's Uncle Lamo. I said, you mean that's her aunt? That that is his aunt. She. That's her uncle. She said, no, 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 no. I'll tell you later. Go on. Say hello to Uncle Lamo. He'd be so pleased. Go, go say hello to Uncle Lamo. Well, I get up, and I, you know, I'm feeling like a fool, and I and I walk over, I walk over to the to the uh, to the to the to these people, and they they've come back now, and they're kind of you know how old people sort of uh, they, they they people come to them. They, no longer is it possible or really necessary, or is it done? They don't go to people. People come to them, you know. They come and say hello. So I'm you know I feel funny. So I'm standing in the outskirts, and finally I go over and I say. Uh, hi, uh, Uncle Emil. Uh, hi. And Uncle Emil turns to me and says, Phil, it is Gene. It is Gene. Five, what a big boy. You have grown to be such a big boy. You are in the army. It is Gene. Oh, it's so good. And he takes my arm and he's shaking my arm. 
And I said, oh, Uncle Emil, uh, it's, 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 you're looking very good, Uncle Emil. And I can't, you know, I, I, I can't even remember. Uncle Emil, Uncle Emil, what the heck? Uncle Emil. And he is holding my arm and he's saying, Gene, what a, what a big boy you are. You are such a big boy. I was always telling your mother years ago, you would get to be bigger than you. You would be a big boy. You would be a fine boy. You are even finer. You are such a fine boy. Oh, uh, Teresa, Teresa, this is Gene. I, I thought you could, uh, do you, have you said hello to Gene? And, you know, and he's so pleased he's out of his skull that I'm saying hello to him. And I says, oh, well, gee, you know, it's good to see Uncle Emil. He says, you, 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 you remember that day on Diversity Boulevard? you remember the time on Diversity Boulevard when we came and we brought, to, Aunt, Aunt Teresa brought the great big bowl of potato salad? you remember the time when, when, when uh, what, 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 what is the occasion I remember? Oh, what was that occasion? That was the time. Oh, yeah, I remember the time. That was the time, Uncle Al. You remember Uncle Al? And he's going on like this. And and, I, and and he's so delighted to see me that you could just see it was it was like the big and, and I, you know, I, I saw, so so I'm shaking my hand and, and Aunt Teresa comes home and she says hi oh, this Jean and I says yes it's 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 me uh, Aunt Teresa and her white hair is shining and she's this beautiful woman this this really beautiful old lady big beautiful old lady you know she's just tremendous dignity about her. And she shakes my hand. She says, it is a very, very big pleasure to have you, to see you again. And, and uh, they, they all had this vague German accent. And, and so then we turned, and there was her husband. She, I, she says, you remember Carl, of course. Well, that's spelled with a K. Three, four, five Ks. Do you remember Carl? And, I, and, of course, I just, you know, I knew that I had to raise a hand. And he says, V. Gates, V. Gates, V. Gates. Oh, who, who, who did you say he was? And, 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 and she says, that's Jean, Jean. That is, that is, that is Anna's Jean. Oh, yeah, 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 Jean, Jean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who oh, you say, Anna? Yeah, Anna. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, oh. And, and we're going on. And we're shaking the hands there. And he doesn't know where we are. You know, he's sort of drifting off. I could see, you know, he's Anna. Who's Anna? Anna, he's Anna, 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 Anna. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, the diversity boulevard. I remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and Uncle Emil is back. He says, oh, you are, you are. Look, you, I I've always knew you was, you was going to be a very good boy. Anna, Anna, Anna. And, and he calls my mother and he says, he says to my mother, ah, you, you are is such a fine boy, such a wonderful boy. Look at that wonderful, such a wonderful boy. And my mother says, oh, yes, yes. And, I said, and, and my friend, the Marine, Buddy, you see, is over on the other side. He's looking at me. <laughs> He's, he is also a corporal, you know. He's looking, well, you know, wow. Well, we, we drift away. And they sort of drift, you know how old people kind of drift along down and everybody's shaking hands with them. And, and old Uncle Lamel sort of drifts past me six or seven steps behind the other two. Well, I cut through the crowd, you know, through the pews, and I get over and I'm saying to him, hey, bud, what is this scene anyway? And he says, don't you remember? This is my cousin. He says, don't, don't you remember? He says, I, he says, this is, don't you remember Teresa's uh, Uncle Emil? I said, no, what, what is this scene? He says, why don't you ask your mother about it? I don't have time. So he goes cutting off into the crowd, and I go back to my mother, and I say, hey, mom, what, what is this? What is this Uncle Emil bit? She said, shh, I will tell you when we're on the way back. Well, we go out to the funeral. And you know how funerals are. Everybody's sort of standing around, and it's raining, and the minister's talking, and everybody's is feeling the vague sense of, of guilt because he doesn't feel as sorry as he thinks he should feel. And he's standing around there, and everybody's talking, you know, and they're sort of looking down, and, and uh, you know, they're playing. And, and, and finally it's all over, and we sort of go drifting back to the cars, and I can see up ahead of me Aunt Teresa, Uncle Carl, and Uncle Emil. And Uncle Emil is about five or six yards behind, and he's just sort of trailing behind them. And all of them get into this limousine, you know, the rented limousine for the purpose. And Uncle Emil and Uncle Carl and Aunt Teresa, great Aunt Teresa, get into one limousine, with a little jump seat, and one of the one of the collateral cousins way out in left field somewhere from Des Plaines, Illinois, gets into the little jump seat with him, you know, and they go down the street. Well, I get into the I get into the cars. <laughs> right away, I want to know what the scene is, you know. And I get into the car and I say, with, with my mother, I say, hey, mom, what 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 the devil is this Uncle Emil thing? She says, you remember Uncle Emil, don't you? I said, well, yeah, vaguely. There's something, but why why is he so delighted to see me? She says, well, I'll tell you. She says, a long time ago, before even I was born, Uncle Emil was courting Aunt Teresa. 
and Uncle Emil was in the lumber business. He was a young man in the lumber business. When all of a sudden, Aunt Teresa met Uncle Carl. Uncle Carl had a very successful law business and was going into politics. And he had this wonderful way of speaking. He had a wonderful way of speaking. I said, well, Ma, what do you mean a wonderful way of speaking? She says, well, that's what my mother told me. He had a wonderful way of speaking. And immediately, Aunt Teresa fell in love with him and married him. And Uncle Emil never gave up. Uncle Emil never gave up. He knew that it was just a way of talking. It wasn't the real person that she married. It was a way of talking. Well, I said, well, Ma, you know, what is it? What, 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 you know, you mean he's never married or anything? She says, no, he's never married. And he's always been the best friend of the family. And, and I said, well, why do they call him Uncle Emil? She says, I don't know. That's just one of those German things. He's Uncle Emil. After a certain point, he became known as Uncle Emil, and all the kids treat him as Uncle Emil. He's an uncle. He's everybody's uncle in the family. I said, but, but how does Uncle Emil feel? She says, I don't know, but he seems to be very happy. And way up ahead of me, I could see that rented limousine and carrying Uncle Emil, Uncle Carl, and great Aunt Teresa and a collateral cousin from Des Plaines, Illinois. Now that is not an invented story in any in any detail. And to give you a kind of little strange postscript to it. Yeah, no, 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 no. If it was for the Saturday Evening Post, it would have happened. But this is what happened. About five years ago, I'd say roughly, or maybe a little longer, I got a letter from my mother. And way down at the bottom of the letter, she says, Do you remember Uncle Emil? Uncle Emil just died. She says, You probably don't remember Uncle Emil, but he just died. He was Aunt Teresa's Uncle Emil. And now, on the other hand, she goes on with completely with the letter and just leaves a drop there, you see. Well, I wrote her a letter back, and I said, of course, do I remember Uncle Emil? Uncle Emil is the story of about 75% of the men I know, except that most of them, you see, somewhere along the line, gave up and married the other one, or another one, which is even a better way to put it, you know, which is even a sadder way to put it, not the other one, but an other one. And somewhere along the line, they have deep within them a great Aunt Teresa. Some great Aunt Teresa. The only thing about Uncle Amos, he never did give up. He just stayed there, you know, and kept watching. He lived her life completely vicariously. He lived this whole vicarious thing with them all the way down the line. Including, that's why he wanted to be Uncle Amos, you see. Including the fact that he even had the kids vicariously and the family. He became an uncle vicariously. Everything, you see. All the way on down the line, he had his he had his whole his whole life was lived out before him like some gigantic picture, some movie he was watching. And I said, I wrote to my mother. I said, I said Hey, I said, Mom, you know, no, don't stop it. I remember Uncle Emil. I certainly remember Uncle Emil. Whatever happened to Aunt Teresa? And she says, Oh, Aunt Teresa's fine. She's going fine. And th th this is our exchange of letters. I said, Well, well. Did, did she miss Uncle Emil? You know, I write back and it's back and forth. Well, she says, of course, everybody loved Uncle Emil. Everybody loved Uncle Emil. There is the key phrase. Everybody loved Uncle Emil. You know, there's a wide, almost an unbelievable gulf of difference between being loved by everybody and being loved by someone. Everybody loved Uncle Emil. And so I wrote back to him. You know, I wrote back to him and I said, yeah, that's true. Everybody loved Uncle Emil. I remember the time Uncle Emil got me by the arm. And Uncle Emil, it was like a little puppy to whom nobody ever says anything. And once suddenly you reach down and pet this dog on the, on the, on the backside, the dog goes out of his skull. 
with delight, you know. Uncle Emil, then it all came back to me. He couldn't believe that somebody really remembered Uncle Emil. Somebody from out of the farthest, you know, one of the, one of the things, these little moving creatures to whom he was an uncle or dreamed that he was or thought he was. And I came up and said, hello, Uncle Emil. It all came back. And, you know, I read this piece about Gizoni here. And it may sound like a really ridiculous, wild, strange, unbelievable, Italianate piece, but it is not so. It just isn't so. Although, then again, on the other hand, I'm not quite so sure that that kind of love is possible in our time any longer. Which is a good question, too, to ask. Good question. Uh, but, but Uncle Emil, Uncle Emil uh, always, to me, represents a kind of thing. And it's funny, you know, this, this kind of image, uh, as long as we're going to go into that sort of image, I remember one time, are you interested in another uh, recollection of that particular kind of world involving the same people? As long as I'm, I'm talking about these, these, this three, these three. Uh, I remember another scene that involved the same th the same trio. We were called it was a, there was a big strange one of the strangest family things that I've ever been to. And of course, as a kid, certain kinds of of events will stick in your mind. Other kinds will go out immediately. The minute you're there, you're 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 bored and you can't stand it. You know. Well, I'm a I'm a very small kid. And we were going to Aunt Teresa's house. It was the only time I'd ever been to Aunt Teresa's house. Believe me, Aunt Teresa's house was a kind of house that was born to have 4,000 ferns in it, or vice versa. I can't tell which came first, ferns or Aunt Teresa's house, although they do tell me that the fern is one of the oldest of all living <laughs> plants. But then, on the other hand, so is Aunt Teresa. And so, so uh, I get, I get, you know, this house, and Aunt Teresa had these things, you know, that are woven out of out of wicker, all around the house, with with thousands of gigantic, beautiful, magnificent ferns, those those light ice icy light green kind, you know, they're just beautiful, great big ferns all over the place. And Aunt Teresa, Aunt Teresa had the ferns everywhere. You'd come in, and she she uh, her one of her main topics of conversation was her ferns and something she called aphids. Which, of course, I, I later did decipher to mean aphids. <laughs> Apparently, these friends, I couldn't figure out what aphids. She was always talking, there we are having trouble with aphids. And, and uh, I, you know, kids, you don't, you don't say to this majestic lady, she was always, she must have been born gray-haired. Uh, you know, that kind of, you know she, always, she was always a majestic gray-haired lady to me, uh, all the time. I, I just never can imagine her any other way. Well, the little kids say, hey, Aunt Teresa, what's an aphid? You don't say that. You just accept that she's got aphids. Oh, we have aph aphids here. And then the ferns. And she goes on and on and on about ferns. So this was the day that we were going to Aunt Teresa's house, which was considered a gigantic uh, episode. It was considered a big thing to go to her house. She rarely had people there. And when you went there, it was ceremony from beginning to end. Well, the reason, the reason we went to Aunt Teresa's house is because Aunt Teresa and Uncle Carl we're going to take the long-awaited, expected, dreamed of, desired, and finally almost fabled return trip to the homeland in Europe where they had come from many eons before. And they were going to go back and visit. Well, now, this <laughs> nobody in our family ever took trips to Europe to begin with. You've got to understand that, that a trip to Europe was not quite like it is now, a trip to Europe then, in the middle of the Depression, was like roughly saying, I'm going to take the next Mercury space shot to Venus. Uh, you know, it just was not an average thing that happened. So they were having a big family party to celebrate Aunt Teresa and Uncle Carl going back to Germany to, to, uh, to, to see, to, to visit to, in the Rhineland. And, and so from beginning to end, it was ceremony. And I recall they had spread out. Now listen to this. This is where the crux comes. They had spread out on the floor of the kitchen. And all, all north side apartments in those days had linoleum on them. There were linoleum on the floor. This was all, every, every kitchen came automatic with linoleum. See, they had linoleum on the floor. And it was like 128 degrees. All old ladies have apartments that are 128 degrees. Don't ask me why. They're all, 
unbelievably hot. And so the kids are all standing around sweating. And, 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 and when you're in a situation like that, there is a certain amount of inhibition, like you don't run around and holler and hit Buddy on the back of the head. You know, it's because we're at Aunt Teresa's house and there are ferns, and my mother says, don't, don't pump the ferns. Now, don't pump the ferns. Now, don't pump. We're at Aunt Teresa's house. Now, stand still, will you? And stop scratching. You're embarrassing everybody. Well, I had some very special places where I would scratch. And, and, uh, and you know, and, and the kids. So, so we're all standing there in the kitchen, all of us. And on the floor is this big diagram spread out on the floor. And they had taped it down at corners, on the corners of it. And the diagram was a great big blueprint of an ocean-going liner. And the ocean-going liner was the liner that Uncle Carl and Aunt Teresa were taking back to Germany. And standing there in the middle of the floor, pointing out all the highlights, was Uncle Emil. Uncle Emil was describing the salon. He had read, he says, and, and, and I have a folder here about the swimming pool and, and the salon. Now, it says here that every night at, at, at 4.30, the salon is open for those who wish to dine early. If you would like to dine early, you, you make an arrangement so that you can dine in the first group of people there. Now, the captain, it says here, dines at the 6.30 dining there. Now, the, the tables are here. Now, if you look over here, there is a passageway which leads down here to the, where they, they have what they call the ship's amusement center. Now, that is where they have little things like, uh, for the things for the kiddies play on the things and stuff. And over here on the other side, they have the, what they call the Class A staterooms. Now, I will show you where Teresa will have her stateroom, and on car, too, of course. They will have their stateroom right here. Now, this is stateroom number 470. Now, I have here a picture of the stateroom inside. Now, you will see that they look out on the, on the, on the right side of the ship there. I don't know whether they call it the port or the, the starboard side, but they look out inside. They see, and you know, they have, they have their big, big, that big, beautiful porthole there. And you notice that they have two tone curtains. And every morning, if you want to, they will call you and it will bring your orange juice right to your bed. Now, uh, Teresa, will, will in the morning, I believe, Teresa, did you say, we, well, Carl, too, of course, he will get up, too, at that time. And then they, they will arrive in, in Hamburg at the 17th of May, and then by the 23rd of May, they will be already there in the Rhineland, there in the, in the hometown now. And by that time, and then on and on and on, Uncle, Uncle Emil goes on and on and on. And we're all standing there eating our sauerkraut, once in a while chewing on our hot dogs, and all of us are itching, and it is getting hotter and hotter.